My name is Jaden Shaw. I'm an oncologist by training and spent about 10 years at MD Anderson Cancer Center for about 10 years uh, before I joined Sumitomo. And I'm currently the Chief Oncology Development Officer at Sumitomo. And I'm excited here really to talk about several products that were in development phase in our phase one trials that were just recently presented at ASH. And just as a quick introduction to Sumitomo, you may not have heard of Sumitomo and many folks may not have heard of us, but in fact, Sumitomo uh, has been around for greater than 400 years with a long-standing history in pharmaceutical drug development outside of oncology, uh, including rare diseases. And we've been focused in the oncology space in the last 10 to 15 years with research and development. Myelofibrosis belongs to a group of diseases called myeloproliferative disorders. And this includes other diseases like polycythemia vera or essential thrombocythemia. And so it's a serious uh, bone marrow disorder and also a rare bone marrow disorder that impacts the body's normal production of blood cells. The typical age for patients who see this is going to be our older patients above the age of 60 or 65. And there's a slightly higher incidence of prevalence in males compared to females, but there are no other established risk factors that we're aware of. And so there may be several symptoms. A, patients may be completely asymptomatic with no symptoms at all. And they'll just be picked up on routine blood work. Or if they do have symptoms, <clears throat> it'll include two main things. One is splenomegaly, which is an increase in the size of the spleen. And so as your disease progresses, that spleen increases in size and can be quite large and have a lot of symptoms, including abdominal discomfort. And the second is something we call constitutional symptoms, which is a constellation of symptoms, including fatigue, night sweats, low-grade fevers, and weight loss. And if you have something called low-risk disease, those are patients uh, with, who are typically asymptomatic at diagnosis, and observation is a typical approach for those patients. However, as you start developing symptoms or you have some high-risk features, you'll be treated with one of two main ways. And one is an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, which is a bone marrow transplant or stem cells using a donor. And the second is really JAK inhibitors. And so the JAK inhibitors have been the mainstay of therapy in the US for the last decade plus. And if you have something called low risk disease, those are patients uh, with, who are typically asymptomatic at diagnosis and observation is a typical approach for those patients. However, as you start developing symptoms or you have some high risk features, you'll be treated with one of two main ways. And one is an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, which is a bone marrow transplant or stem cells using a donor. And the second is really JAK inhibitors. And so the JAK inhibitors have been the mainstay of therapy in the US for the last decade plus. What we know is that TP3654 is an oral investigational inhibitor or selective inhibitor of PIM1 kinase. Now, why is that important? <clears throat> one, because we know that PIM1 is significantly elevated in patients with myelofibrosis in their bone marrow, in their hematopoietic or their stem cells. And we know that elevated PIM1 in the published data contributes to the cancer activation, cytokine modulation, which are these pro-inflammatory proteins or cytokines, through multiple pathways. And then in our preclinical work, we've shown that if we can inhibit PIM1 with 3654 in mouse models and other preclinical models, we have shown that we can reduce cytokines, inhibit this proliferation or growth of these cancer cells, and lead to apoptosis or death of these cancer cells. And additionally, we've seen in mouse models that with 3654, we can reduce the spleen size and improve the bone marrow fibrosis in these mouse models. And so this body of data now uh, in the preclinical setting <clears throat> is the data that supports the phase one ongoing clinical trial. The intent of this trial was to look at monotherapy or single agent 3654 in patients with intermediate or high-risk myelofibrosis who had been previously treated or ineligible for a JAK inhibitor. So in this patient population, we've now used escalating or uh, <clears throat> doses of 3654 and shown one of several things. Number one, we've shown that it's uh, well tolerated 
with limited myelosuppression or limited drops in their blood counts. And that's important because a lot of our cancer therapies can cause drops in their blood counts. We've shown that the side effects now is going to be predominantly nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, which are low grade and with prophylactic therapy can be managed. And so we now are getting to what we think is the right dose of 3654. And now we've started seeing early signals of clinical activity with reductions in splenic volume, as well as improvements in the symptom burns. And those are two key measures for we look at how to to identify if a drug works in myelofibrosis. And so we've seen now a 20% of the patients will have a 35% reduction in their spleen size, which is well-established endpoint. And when you look at TSS-50, which is a 50% improvement in your symptoms, now we've seen more than 50% of patients have that type of improvement. So right now, we're still establishing the best dose as we move forward into our subsequent trials. And so we're enrolling some more patients in our phase one trial to make sure that we have the optimal dose as we balance that between the risks and side effects. The second step is really combination therapies. And we've mentioned JAK inhibitors are the only standard of care right now in the U.S. and they are the only class of drugs approved. And we know the future is going to be combinations because we have to improve outcomes in patients. And so the next step is going to be combination therapies that we'll be looking to start in early 2024 with various JAK inhibitors. There's, in fact, several different types of leukemia, so it's important to be specific. We have AML, which is a type of acute leukemia that typically is seen in older patients, and that's where we're going to focus most of our attention today. There's ALL. And that's another type of acute leukemia, acute leukemia that affects typically younger pediatric patients and young adults. And then there's chronic leukemias as well, CML and CLL. So when we think about acute leukemias, there's four different uh, broad categories. We're going to be focusing on AML today. So with AML patients, <clears throat> historically been treated with what we would define as standard cytotoxic chemotherapy. And these are chemotherapies that have been around for decades and are effective. But what we see in the evolution of AML is really a, an evolution towards targeted therapy or personalized medicine. So now, for example, if you have a FLT3 mutation, there are FLT3 inhibitors that you'll be often treated with in combination with chemotherapy. Then the other important option is also an allogeneic stem cell transplant as well. And that's another important way that patients are often managed if they're a transplant candidate and have an available uh, donor. So with 5336, we're focused, again, in the space of targeted therapy, and we're focused on patients with a disease that has specifically an NPM1 mutation or an MLLR rearrangement. And when you look at these two subtypes of patients, that is the space that we think that has the best probability to respond to a menin inhibitor. And so a menin inhibitor targets these specific mutations or translocations uh, biologically. 5336 is being evaluated in patients with relapsed AML. And initially, we started with uh, enrolling patients that were all comers, regardless of their mutational status. However, with emerging clinical data, we've now focused on these two specific mutations, NPM1 or MLR rearrangement. And what we've seen in our phase one dose escalation is two things. We've shown that now we're getting close to what we think is the therapeutic dose, a dose that's active, but also safe. And so we're in the process of confirming that exact dose. Number two, we've shown a reasonable safety profile. And so when we look at our adverse events or the side effects that come with 5336, we're also seeing that the main side effect that we see is grade one and two or low grade nausea and vomiting that can be manageable. Importantly, when we do this drug development, we also need to understand what other side effects we may see and also what we don't see. And that's important. So in our phase one trial so far, what we have seen is that we have not seen any cardiac events or heart toxicity. Yeah, so with 5336, again, we are ongoing in our phase one trial, trying to establish the right or the best dose for patients balancing side effects and efficacy. And so we're continuing to enroll uh, patients in our phase one trial to establish this right or best dose 
moving forward. And then subsequently, the next step will be combination therapies. And we know combination therapies are important, combining 5-3-3-6 with standard of care uh, regimens. And that will be the next step for us is A, confirm with the best doses to move forward. And then two, start combining with various uh, different therapies in 2024.